The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle by Conan Doyle I had called upon my friend Sherlock Holmes upon the second morning after Christmas, with the intention of wishing him the compliments of the season. He was lounging upon the sofa in a purple dressing gown, a pipe rack within his reach upon the right, and a pile of crumpled morning papers, evidently newly studied, near at hand. Beside the couch was a wooden chair, and on the angle of the back hung, a very city and just reputable hard felt hat, much the worst for wear and cracked in several places. A lens and a forceps lying upon the seat of the chair suggested that the hat had been suspended in this manner for the purpose of examination. You are engaged, said I. Perhaps I interrupt you. Not at all. I'm glad to have a friend with whom I can discuss my results. The matter is a perfectly trivial one. He jerked his thumb in the direction of the old hut. But there are points in connection with it which are not entirely devoid of interest and even of instruction. I seated myself in his armchair and warmed my hands before his crackling fire, for a sharp frost had set in and the windows were thick with the ice crystals. I suppose, I remarked, that, homely as it looks, this thing has some deadly story linked on to it that it is a clue which will guide you in the solution of some mystery and the punishment of some crime. No, no, no crime, said Sherlock Holmes, laughing. Only one of these whimsical little incidents which will happen when you have four million human beings all jostling each other within the space of a few square miles. Amid the action of any reaction of so dense and swarm of humanity, every possible combination of events may be expected to take place and many a little problem will be presented, which may be striking and bizarre, without being criminal. We have already had experience of such. So much so, I remarked, that of the last six cases which I have added to my notes, three have been entirely free of any legal crime. Precisely, you allude to my attempt to recover the iron lead papers to the singular case of Miss Mary Sutherland and to the adventure of the man with the twisted lip. Well, I have no doubt that this small matter will fall into the same innocent category. You know Peterson, the commissioner? Yes, it is to him that this trophy belongs. It is his hat? No, no, he found it. Its owner is unknown. I beg that you will look upon it, not as a battered billycock, but, but as an intellectual problem. And first, as to how it came here, it arrived upon Christmas morning, in company with a goose-fat goose which is, I have no doubt, roasting at this moment in front of Peterson's fire. The fact are this. About four o'clock on Christmas morning, Peterson, who, as you know, is a very honest fellow, was returning from some small jollification and was making his way homewards down Tottenham Court Road. In front of him, he saw, in the gaslight, a tallish man, walking with a slight stagger and carrying a white goose slung over his shoulder. As he reached the corner of Good Street, a row broke out between the stranger and a little knot of roughs. One of the latter knocked off the man's hat, on which he raised his stick to defend himself, and, swinging it over his head, smashed the shop window behind him. Peterson had rushed forward to protect the stranger from his assailants, but the man, shocked at having broken the window and seeing an official-looking person in uniform rushing towards him, dropped his goose took his heels and vanished amid the labyrinth of small street, which lie at the back of Tottenham Court Road. The roughs had also fled at the appearance of Peterson, so that he was left in possession of the field battle, and also of the spoils of Victoria in the shape of this battered hat and a most impeachable Christmas goose, which surely he restored to their owner. My dear fellow, there lies the problem. It is true that, for Mrs. Henry Baker, was printed upon a small card which was, which was tied to the bird's left leg. And it, it is also true that initial HB are legible upon the lining of this hat. But as there are some thousands of bakers and some hundreds of Henry bakers in this city of ours, it is not easy to restore lost property to any one of them. What then did Pe Peterson do? He brought round both hat and goose to me on Christmas morning, knowing that even the smallest problems are of interest to me. The goose we retained until this morning, where there were signs that, in spite of the slight frost, it would be well that it should be eaten without unnecessary delay. Its finder has carried it off, therefore to fulfill the ultimate destiny of a goose.